Hi, beautiful friends of Bookish Fan. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. I'm glad that you are here hanging out with me today. Today we are here to do my final September wrap up. So this wrap up is going to cover all of the books that I have read since I did my mid-month wrap up. I'm not going to be discussing in this video any of the books that I talked about in that mid-month wrap up, but I will be sure to link it down below if you are interested in seeing what I read during the first half of the month of September. I do have nine additional books to talk to you about today, so we are going to go ahead and just jump right in. The very first book that I read after that mid-month wrap up was Little Secrets by Jennifer Hillier. This was sent to me as part of the monthly gifting group that I'm a part of on Facebook, and I'm so incredibly glad that it was sent to me because because I think that this has become my favorite Jennifer Hillier to date. So this follows our main character, Marin Machado, and on the outside, it seems like she has a perfect life. She is happily married to her college sweetheart, who is a successful businessman. She herself actually owns a series of very successful hair salons that cater to very wealthy and privileged clients. And of course, they have a precious four-year-old son named Sebastian. But one day they are in Pike Place Market in Seattle shopping. It is the holiday season, so it is teeming with holiday shoppers and tourists. It is just Marin and Sebastian, her husband, is off doing something else and she kind of gets distracted briefly with her phone and then suddenly Sebastian is kidnapped. But 15 months later, Marin is still very much struggling to cope. She cannot let it go. She's determined to find out what happened to her son. At this point, her marriage is kind of falling apart. She and her husband no longer speak and the FBI are really no longer prioritizing Sebastian's case. So it's kind of gone cold. And so she decides to hire a private investigator in the hopes that it might stir up something that could lead them to Sebastian. But in the course of the investigation, they don't find anything about Sebastian, but they do find out that Derek, Marin's husband, has been having an affair with a much younger woman, a woman that is in her early 20s. And at this point, Marin is absolutely desperate to hold on to what she has left. She has lost her son. She is not going to lose her husband too. And so she kind of decides to focus on a problem that she can solve. And that problem is named Kenzie. And she is determined to make this problem go away permanently. I enjoy this one immensely. I enjoyed it from start to finish. I found it engaging. It was compulsively readable. I was anxious to find out what happened. I wanted to know what was going down. And I actually really enjoyed the direct direction that this took. Jennifer Hillier is certainly an author that is not afraid to go to dark places, which I really appreciate. There was just something about this one that really connected with me. And like I said, I think that this could potentially be my newest favorite Jennifer Hillier. I just really enjoyed the direction that Jennifer Hillier took this. I enjoyed all of the twists and turns. It was just a really good, dark, disturbing, fun time. And I was here for it. So I give this a solid four stars. Immediately after Little Secrets, I picked up The Housemaid by Frieda McFadden. So this is certainly a suspense thriller that is getting a lot of hype. I'm very late to the game with this one because I know a lot of people have read and loved it. It wasn't actually on my radar to pick up until recently and then I was lucky enough to receive this in a book box that I am trying and so I immediately picked it up and I'm extremely glad that I did. So this follows our main character Millie and she is desperately trying to find a job. She has actually recently just been released from a 10-year prison sentence. She lost the job that she had prior. She's living in her car and she needs something desperately in order to have a place to live and basically build back her life. And so she's given the opportunity to interview as a housemaid for the Winchester family. It's a very privileged, wealthy family. And she doesn't think that there's any way that she's going to get this job, what with her background. But she goes in, she interviews with Nina Winchester, who is the wife and the mother in this family. And things seem to go well. And much to her surprise, Millie is offered the job. And luckily for her, it is a live-in position. And so she is eager to accept this job. And she is even more eager to do a good job. But it doesn't take long for her to realize that there is something going on with Nina Winchester. Nina Winchester is flaky. She's flighty. She'll tell Millie to do something one minute and then completely forget that she told Millie and then yell at Millie for doing what she was told to do or she will think that she told Millie to do something when she actually didn't and then she'll get mad at Millie for not doing the thing that she was never told to do in the first place so things like that. It seems like Nina Winchester is very unhinged very unstable but Millie is determined to put up with this erratic behavior because like I said this is a very cush job for her she has a place to live it's not such a bad deal even though Nina Winchester is unhinged and her daughter is a little bit creepy let's be honest and luckily Millie receives a lot of support from Nina's husband Andrew I believe his name was. Andrew recognizes that his wife's behavior is definitely erratic. And so he comes to Millie's defense whenever he can. And something serious soon starts to develop between Millie and Andrew. Millie feels that Andrew could do so much better than Nina. And of course, after being with Nina for so long, Andrew is kind of tired of it. He wants something different. He wants somebody more stable. And so he and Millie have a chemistry and attraction and they kind of act on that attraction. And I do not want to say more than that what happens after Millie and Andrew strike up their relationship because I do not want to risk spoilers. I feel like everything really picks up and the twists and turns start happening after this 
this point in the book. So I really feel like that's all that I want to say about this. I truly believe that this book is really worth all the hype that it is getting. This is another one that was engaging from start to finish. It was compulsively readable. I wanted to see what the result was going to be of Nina's erratic behavior and Millie's relationship with Andrew. I wanted to see if there was something going on with the kid that we should be concerned about. Like there were a whole lot of different aspects in this book that really had me intrigued. And I was very interested in the way that Frieda McFadden took this story, but more importantly, how she ended this story. If you have read this, you'll know what I'm talking about. Something very significant happens at the end of this book that really influences the way that Millie is going to go about her life and her job in the future. And I admit that when I finished this, I kept thinking about it. I thought about it for a couple of days afterwards and just kind of kept wanting to be back with these characters. As twisted as they were, I just had such a positive reading experience with this. So I highly recommend this one if you have not read it. Again, solid four stars. This is probably one of the better thrillers that I've read this year for sure. I was on a roll with the thriller suspense novels, so I continued with None of This is True by Lisa Jewell. This is definitely one of my most anticipated reads of the year because I absolutely love Lisa Jewell and this one was getting so much hype and praise. It seemed like everybody who was reading this, even people who had never read Lisa Jewell before or who had read Lisa Jewell and didn't really enjoy her previous books, absolutely loved this. And so I was very hyped going into this one, of course. So this follows our main character, Alex Summers. She is a successful podcast host and one day she is out at a pub celebrating her 45th birthday and she meets Josie Fair and it turns out that Josie Fair was actually born on the exact same day at the exact same hospital as Alex and they are birthday twins. And upon finding out who Alex is, Josie actually approaches Alex with a new podcast idea. It's a podcast idea surrounding Josie's life. Josie kind of wants to tell Alex her story. And of course, as a journalist, Alex is very intrigued by this premise. And so even though she's hesitant at first, she doesn't exactly know what to think about the stranger who is coming and approaching her with this podcast idea. She knows absolutely nothing about this woman or her life. She is very intrigued by the promise of a great story. And so she takes Josie up on the offer. But as they start recording, Josie starts recounting some deeply disturbing facts about her life and Alex cannot help but be concerned about what she is hearing. But no matter how concerned she is, she knows that this promises to be one hell of a story. It could be great for her podcast and so she continues with it. Unfortunately for her, before she knows it, Josie has kind of wiggled herself into Alex's life. She's kind of infiltrated it. She is always around. But soon enough, Josie is gone. Not just gone, disappeared. And in her wake, some terrifying secrets and lies are uncovered that Josie has been telling. Alex is not sure what is real, what is not, who she can trust. And suddenly she finds herself to be the subject of her own podcast. Her podcast has now become true crime as all these secrets and lies are revealed. And now she is in the thick of it because she befriended Josie. She started this podcast with Josie and now she is right in the middle of this. So none of this is true. I would say is definitely a departure from things that Lisa Jewell naturally does because first of all, there is definitely a podcast element to this, which she has never done before. And I will say that this is probably one of the most well done podcast elements in a story that I have ever read. If you have the opportunity to listen to this on audio, I highly recommend that you do so because there is definitely a full cast like in the podcast elements when they're doing interviews and things like that. And I just really enjoyed that element. Something else that's kind of different about this is that this is a story that is set entirely within the present timeline. There are not multiple timelines. There are a couple of different perspectives as you were switching back and forth between Alex and Josie. But a lot of the times in past Lisa Jules, there have been multiple perspectives and multiple timelines and that's not what this is. So this was a departure in many ways, but overall I feel like Lisa Jewell did a tremendous job with it. And like I said, it was just getting such consistent praise and I can see why so many people love this. I can certainly say that this is Lisa Jewell's strongest. Like I said, the podcast element was extremely well done. I enjoyed the twists and turns in the story overall. I like the way that it's crafted. That has never been an issue with me with Lisa Jewell. She knows how to create a twisty, turny, thriller suspense ride that just takes you on a journey and you're just kind of enthralled from start to finish. And that is certainly the way that this was done. I do admit that I think that some of my expectations were a little bit different. I don't know if that's just because I was misunderstanding the synopsis of this, but there was an element in here that I wasn't necessarily expecting. It is one of my least favorite thriller tropes, and that is basically the trope of the unhinged woman. You know, like the unhinged woman who is trying to steal the other woman's husband or who is trying to infiltrate their life. I just really hate seeing that in suspense thrillers, and there were certainly aspects of that in here because of Josie. I did ultimately find Lisa Jewell's usage of the trope to be somewhat unique and unexpected, so it didn't bother me too terribly much as it might have done in another author's work. So it ultimately only slightly hindered my enjoyment of it. But overall, this was still a very solid read. I don't think Lisa Jewell could do much wrong in my eyes, to be honest with you. This again was another four stars. I'm just kind of like killing it with a suspense thriller game these days. Like I said, I really enjoyed it. I highly recommend. If you have never read a Lisa Jewell, this would certainly be a fantastic place to start. The journey was very, very interesting. It was a roller coaster ride for sure. And I highly recommend. Then randomly, I ended up picking up Fearless 14 by Janet Ivanovich. This is the 14th book in her Stephanie Plum series. I actually was in between books, like after I finished None of This is True, I had to wait for things to come in from my library and I was in scrib jail, if I remember correctly. And so I ended up pulling another prompt 
prompt from my challenge cup and it was to read the next book in the Stephanie Plum series. So I went ahead and did this because these books are extremely fast. I'm able to listen to them in one day because the audiobooks are so short and this was no different. If you're not familiar, this series follows Stephanie Plum, who is an accidental bounty hunter. But in these stories, you're basically following her and all of the shenanigans that she gets into. There's typically a car that's blowing up, somebody who is trying to kill her. And there are a bunch of wacky, quirky characters in here. And that's really what these stories are about. All of the insane characters that are in Stephanie Plum's life. They are incredibly hilarious. You just cannot help but fall in love with them. And that's what really makes these worth the read. Some are better than others. I really don't feel like this was the strongest in the series so far. In fact, I've kind of lost all of the details that I've read. After a certain amount of time, a lot of these just kind of like blend together. But I still really enjoy my reading experiences with these. Like I said, they are a fun, fast, good time. And I plan on continuing in the series. In fact, I do plan on reading the 15th book for October. It is already on my TBR. So these are just great palette cleansers. Like I said, I can absolutely fly through them. And so this was another one checked off my list. Another book in a series down. And I'm happy to be making such good progress in this series this year. It wasn't expected at all. So I'm glad that it's happening. Next, I ended up picking up Love Theoretically by Allie Hazelwood. My library loan came in for this. So I went ahead and picked it up, even though I was still kind of in like a thriller suspense mindset. I admit that I went into this one very trepidatiously. And that is because I did not enjoy Love on the Brain. I was really disappointed in that story, especially after loving the love hypothesis so much. I went into Love on the Brain having such high expectations and it really let me down. I gave it a three stars. There were a lot of technical issues that I had with it. And so I went in this one kind of expecting not to like it, kind of expecting to give up on Allie Hazelwood as an author. But I'm so glad to say that I absolutely adored this one and it has kind of restored my faith in Allie Hazelwood. So this follows our main character, Dr. Elsie Hannaway by day. She is an adjunct professor of theoretical physics. She is barely making ends meet. She makes practically no money. She has no health insurance and she's teaching students that she would rather not be teaching. But by night, Elsie works for an app called Faux. And this is literally an app where people can go on and request a date. So like if somebody needs a date to a wedding or something like that, they can go onto this website and request a date. And that's what Elsie does by night to make ends meet. And with this app, you're technically not supposed to date somebody more than once. But Elsie makes an exception for Greg, who is this sweet, shy, socially awkward scientist who is afraid to tell his family he is ace. So in order to kind of please his family, he hires Elsie as a continuous date and she will attend family functions with him and everything like that. Unfortunately, her two lives collide spectacularly when she's going to interview for a tenured faculty track at MIT. And one of the people on the hiring team is Jack, who is actually Greg's brother. So naturally, Jack is completely confused and floored when Elsie shows up to this interview because he knows her as a librarian who is dating his brother. And so he does not understand. He thinks that she has been lying to his brother and he is furious about that because he and his brother are very, very close. So now not only does she have to deal with the fact that Jack thinks she's a liar and he's going to be one of the people that's responsible for hiring her, but Jack also has kind of a notorious history because 15 years prior, he was part of a scandal that simultaneously ruined Elsie's mentor's career and that kind of humiliated and undermined the reputation of theoretical physicists everywhere. So Elsie actually kind of has a chip on her shoulder about Jack. But of course, as she's spending more and more time with Jack, as they are getting to know each other, she starts to let her guard down. She starts to be the true Elsie, the one that she's afraid that nobody will love and she starts to realize that she is lovable just the way that she is and of course some misunderstandings are cleared up and the truth comes out and there is a happily ever after at the end of this. Ultimately I don't really have too terribly much to say. I don't have a lot of criticisms about this one. I really enjoyed watching our two main characters come together and get to know each other. I like them individually as characters and then of course I like them together as characters as they were getting to know each other and clever banter. I think that Allie Hazelwood is an incredibly talented writer. She's got clever prose, she's got witty banter, not to mention all of the science. She's definitely an extremely smart human being. And this definitely included a lot of that trademark writing that we have come to know in the love hypothesis and even love on the brain. Like my problem with love on the brain was not her writing. It was just some of the content in the story. And so I'm very glad that I ended up enjoying this one because it restored my faith in Allie Hazelwood. I will absolutely be reading more in this series if she decides to come out with any more. And I gave this one a four stars. Oh, also I forgot to mention that I gave Fearless 14 three stars. That was just okay. After finishing Love Theoretically, I ended up picking up Summer Children by Dot Hutchinson. This is the third book in her collector series. Series. This again was another result of being in between books and needing to figure out what I was going to read before my next library loan came in and so forth. So my next challenge pool was to read the next book in this series. This is a series of four books that primarily follow a small team of FBI agents who work exclusively in cases involving children. So severe cases involving like child sexual assault, murder, and things of that nature. And honestly, The Summer Children has turned out to be my favorite in the series so far. I love that the series is getting stronger and stronger as it goes rather than weaker and weaker. I think The Butterfly Garden so far was my least favorite and it just keeps getting better and better. This book actually primarily focuses on Agent Mercedes Ramirez, who again is part of that small FBI team. One night she is driving home from work and there is a child who 
who was covered in blood sitting on her front porch. The child was told to come ask for Mercedes Ramirez because she would keep that child safe. And it turns out that there is somebody out there calling themselves an angel. And what they are doing is basically killing bad parents. So parents who are neglectful, abusive, who are sexually assaulting their children, or even parents who are just standing by while the other parent is doing something to the children. So basically she is taking out all of these bad parents. She is taking the kids and she is dropping them off on Mercedes Ramirez's doorstep. And it continues to happen over and over and over again. Naturally, they are trying to get to the bottom of exactly why Mercedes Ramirez was chosen. And so as you can imagine, there is definitely a lot of dark undertones here. A lot of bad things have happened to these kids. What I really love about these stories is just how close the small team of FBI agents is to one another. They are all very much family. And I also appreciate how close they are to some of the people that they have helped. Like you see some of the victims from the first book and from the second book all together as they are kind of building their own family and how the FBI agents have kind of taken them on as like younger siblings. And I think that it's very heartwarming and touching. They all love each other. And they all know that they have been through some serious, serious trauma and they are all there to help each other out. And I am kind of actually sad that there's only one more book left in this series. I don't know how it's going to end, but I will certainly be finishing it. And I'm glad that I have stuck with the series because I wasn't sure if I was going to after the Butterfly Garden. But like I said, they just keep getting better and better. The Summer Children so far has been the strongest one for me. And again, this was another solid four star read. A lot of the reads that I had in September, thankfully, were solid four stars. And I couldn't be more pleased about that. Next, I ended up finishing Ink Blood Sister Scribe by Emma Torres. This is the beautiful Illumicrate edition. I started this earlier in September and just managed to finish it recently. So this is set in the real world, but essentially magic exists in this world, but it can only be channeled through certain books. These books are special because they have actually been written in the blood of magical scribes. And this story is particularly following two sisters, Joanna and Esther, and they come from a family that can actually hear these books. And their father has basically spent his entire life dedicated to finding and preserving and protecting these books. And in this book, Joanna has kind of taken on the legacy of her father. She has basically spent her life dedicated to protecting these books. She keeps the wards up on their house every single night. She is at the point in her adulthood when she's kind of estranged from her sister Esther, who left when she was 18 and never came back. She wants her sister to come home, but what she doesn't know is that Esther has to remain away because Esther is actually immune to magic. And so what that means is that the wards actually don't protect her. And so if she is anywhere near her family, people can find them. And there is actually an organization out there that desperately wants to find the books that are in this collection and they are willing to kill for them. So you're following the perspectives of Esther and Joanna and you're also following the perspective of Nicholas. He lives in London and he actually was born and raised in an extremely grand library full of these magical books. And Nicholas himself is a scribe. And so what that means is that he can actually write these magical books. He has really never known anything else but this library. He was born there. He was raised there. He lives there and he doesn't really leave there all that often if at all. And so you're kind of following what happens when some things start to go down. Nicholas gets connected with Esther and Joanna and they're starting to realize that a lot of secrets have been hidden from them. Things that they never knew before and they're trying to take down the danger that is actually after Joanna and her family. So I was actually really intrigued by the premise of this one. That is why I went ahead and purchased the beautiful Illumicrate edition because I thought that it sounded wonderful and when I started reading this story I was really captivated by the writing. I really enjoyed Emma Torres' writing overall. I enjoyed following the individual perspectives of the sisters and kind of what was going on in their own lives because they were vastly different. Unfortunately I feel like the execution in this one was lacking. I feel like it was overall very dry. It was very very slow. I feel like the pacing of this was extremely drawn out and for the most part I felt it was too long for what it was. And you know by the end when we're getting to some of the reveals they were okay but they were for the most part anticlimactic. They weren't anything shocking. It just felt like we took a long time to get to something that could have possibly been taken care of in like 300 pages. So unfortunately I only gave this three stars which I'm actually very very surprised by. I was expecting to enjoy this one way more than I did but it was just too long and drawn out for me. I started to lose momentum on it pretty quickly. I actually really didn't like Nicholas's perspective at all just because I didn't understand it and I felt it was way more boring and less interesting than the perspective of the girls. So overall pacing on this, my disparate interest in the perspectives, how long and drawn out it was and how kind of slow, I don't know, ultimately it didn't work for me the way that I wanted it to and so I only gave it a three stars. Would I be willing to read more from Emma Torres in the future? I think so. I definitely would think so because I enjoyed the premise of it overall. I just really didn't think that there was enough oomph worthy of 406 pages. So unfortunately I only gave this a three stars. Next I ended up picking up Speakeasy by Serena Bowen. This is the fifth book in her True North series, which is a series of companion romance novels that you could basically read individually. You don't have to read them in any particular order. But this is actually one that's supposed to be on my October TBR, but I went ahead and read it now because it's one of the books that really wasn't fitting the vibe that I had in mind for October. And it was actually one that was readily available to me now because I had to get it on Audible because it's an Audible exclusive. Like I said, this is the fifth book in the series and it follows Mae Shipley. Mae Shipley is the younger sister of Griff Shipley, who is the main love interest from the very first 
first book. One day she's walking into a local bar called the Gin Mill, I believe it is run by Alec. Alec is somebody that she grew up with. They've known each other their entire lives. He kind of has a little bit of a rivalry with Griff. So their family relationships are not close, but of course they know of each other. And May is walking into Alec's establishment and she sees her girlfriend making out with another woman. So naturally things are kind of imploding for May right in front of Alec's eyes. And Alex kind of swoops in and saves the day before things can become really, really violent. Takes May out. He actually takes her to their house so she can pack her things and move out. And he's just kind of there to be the hero of the moment. And over the next few days, Alex kind of checks in with May to make sure that she's okay. And May asks if he wouldn't mind accompanying her to an alumni function at her former law school because her ex is going to be there as well. And so she and Alec kind of fake date for the night. They have a really good time. Alec and May are sitting out in his truck. They are talking and things get hot and heavy and they kind of have wild and impulsive casual sex in the front of Alex's truck. And from that point on, kind of a friends with benefits situation occurs as they start sleeping with each other casually. May is in no place to be starting another relationship and Alex is kind of known as a party boy, a good time boy. He really is not the type to be in a relationship anyway. So they feel like this arrangement kind of works for both of them. But then of course, feelings start getting involved. This is actually a story where the guy kind of falls first. To be honest, I actually consider this the weakest in the series so far. This is definitely my least favorite. I don't think Serena Bowen did a good enough job of convincing me that there was chemistry and sexual attraction between these two characters before she ended up having them sleep together. There was no buildup even to this casual sexual relationship that they had and I just didn't buy it. I just didn't buy the relationship that they were having. And then of course it goes from that casual relationship into something more and this all happens in the span of I want to say like six weeks. So it was very very quick and I didn't have enough of an opportunity to actually connect to these characters or their relationships or to care about it. What I found actually most interesting about the story was their story arcs separate from one another. Alec was dealing with some things concerning his business and expanding and there were some complications there and I found all of that really intriguing. And then May herself is struggling with sobriety. She had a problem with alcohol and she has been dealing with it. She's been sober for probably about a year and a half at this point and it is something that she constantly has to think about. And so I found both of those things more interesting than when they were actually together. Even though this one didn't quite work for me, it was still an overall enjoyable and positive reading experience. Again, it's another one that's crossed off my list. Another series that I have made more progress. And the very last book that I'm going to talk to you about today is one that I just finished yesterday and that is The Last House on the Street by Diane Chamberlain. Y'all know that Diane Chamberlain has quickly become one of my favorite historical fiction authors. I just find her books so incredibly captivating and compelling and this one was really no different. So this has two different perspectives. The first is 1965 and you're following Ellie Hockley. She grew up in a very well-off town called Round Hill, North Carolina. She's from a very privileged, well-known family in the community and she's basically expected to be the proper Southern lady. But she definitely has a rebellious streak in her. And when she finds out about an initiative called Scope, which is basically an initiative to help Black people register to vote, she wants to do that. Now, of course, everybody in her family and her life is completely scandalized by this. They don't want her to have anything to do with this. She's a young white girl in the South. This is actually going to be something that is extremely dangerous for her to do. She sees so much of the injustice in her area. She realizes a lot of the racism that's inherent in a lot of the people that she loves and trusts. And she just doesn't want to deal with it anymore. She wants to be the change. She wants to make a difference. And she she goes and she becomes part of this scope initiative. And during this time, she meets Wynn, who is a black boy from a town in North Carolina right near hers. And he is going to be part of this initiative as well. She ends up falling in love with him, which of course is a very forbidden and illegal thing for them to happen at this time. And when people discover her relationship with this boy, I'm sure that you can only imagine the reactions and some very terrifying things start to happen. And then the present timeline is 2010. You're following our main character, Kayla Carter. She and her husband are both architects and they just recently finished designing the home of their dream. Dreams. But unfortunately, the home is now tainted because Kayla's young husband, Jackson, who was only 29, actually died of an accident within the home. This is her dream home, but now she no longer has her husband and this house is going to kind of have bad memories for the entirety of the time that she lives there. So she's very trepidatious, but she does move in and she ends up connecting with Ellie Hockley, whose family still reside in the same place that they always have. And it's the only other house there in the area, which is currently being built up. Kayla, like I said, is already very trepidatious about moving into this home, but she gets a very negative feeling about the woods behind her house. And of course, the lake and a lot of people are telling her that it's haunted and there are actually some people who are trying to persuade her not to move into that house. So there are a lot of sinister things going on with her house and the area behind her house. And soon she actually connects with Ellie Hockley. Ellie has only recently returned from San Francisco, California after 45 years of being away. She is back to take care of her brother and mother who are both gravely ill and who are likely not long for this world. So Kayla connects with Ellie and she soon starts to realize that there are some long buried secrets that Ellie is hiding and it's actually secrets that may actually include Kayla's father who knew Ellie. Ellie when they were both young and living in the area. And so in the past timeline, you are following Ellie as she's part of the Scopes movement and what happens as she's trying to fight for civil rights and falling for this young black 
boy and then in the present you're kind of following Kayla as she's hearing a lot of rumors about what went down in the woods behind her house. She's very scared. She's very upset. She's very worried about the safety of her four-year-old daughter and she is determined to get answers and so you're following her as all of these things are being uncovered. And in true Diane Chamberlain fashion this was just so incredibly well done. It was poignant. It was harrowing. There were a lot of very difficult things to read about in this story especially as it regarded race relations, how black people were treated and how they were living in North Carolina during this time and how even Ellie was treated as a white woman who was trying to help these black people and then not to mention what was going on with the boy that she was falling in love with. It was absolutely atrocious but again captivating and compelling. I can't use two better words to describe a Diane Chamberlain novel. I will say that this one took me a little bit longer to get into than some of her other ones. I wasn't really truly interested and captivated in the story until probably the latter half of it but overall I still thought that it was very very well done. I will read basically anything that Diane Chamberlain writes going forward because I just think that she is so incredibly talented. I absolutely love her in the way that she is able to tell a story. Her books are just so strong. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and stick with the four stars for this. I don't think that it would be a 4.5 just because like I said it took me a little bit longer to get into than some of her other books but of course by the end of the story I was absolutely enthralled. I was amazed. I was almost in tears to be honest with you and I just thought that this was wonderful. So again highly recommend. All right everybody those are all of the books that I read in the second half of September. If you've read any of these books please comment down below and let me know what your thoughts are. I would love to know or if you've made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty go ahead and leave me a house emoji in honor of the last house on the street. I love seeing these emojis. It lets me know that you're watching and of course it really really helps out my channel and as always if you like this video or if you just like me please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I aim to post one video a week sometimes two depending on what I could do and I always love seeing and chatting with you in these videos or on any of my other social media platforms. I always leave links to my Goodreads, IG threads, and Instagram down below so we can connect on any of those if you would like to but until next time guys bye